Hello, welcome to Sonar World. I'm Dr. Tony Bufar. Sonar World has been kind enough to invite me to talk to you about the dynamic ultrasound imaging of the upper extremity. Dynamic imaging is very important to, when you look at the musculoskeletal system, especially since you can see the entire extent and rotation of all the structures that you're supposed to explore. We're going to look at the entire upper limb today from the shoulder down to the fingertips. And now we can begin by looking at the, the all-important shoulder. For the dynamic imaging of the musculoskeletal system, let's begin with a shoulder, which is the most requested examination here in the United States. Mike, uh, who's going to look at you right now, is our model. And we're going to begin by looking at a four-quadrant approach of the shoulder. We're going to look at the anterior quadrant, the superior quadrant, the lateral quadrant, and the posterior quadrant. In the anterior quadrant, we'll begin by showing you several dynamic explorations of the anterior region of the shoulder. We begin by putting the probe transversely across the patient's upper arm and locating the bone acoustic landmark of the long bicipital tendon and the bicipital groove you can see that the long bicipital tendon is central within the bicipital groove. We're going to first test the location and the stability of the long bicipital tendon in short axis mainly, but it's always important to recognize that this has a fibrillar pattern in the long axis, therefore is compatible with a tendinous structure. You go back to the short axis view and we're going to ask our model, Mike, to go ahead and swing his hand and forearm outwards. And as he swings outwards, notice that the long bicipital tendon stays within the bicipital groove. One important thing as he cycles through the internal and external rotation is you do have to follow the long bicipital tendon within the bicipital groove. And one of the things you have to remember is that you cannot apply too much compression. So you have to lighten up, otherwise you may trap a subluxing long bicipital tendon. So the first dynamic imaging that you see in the Sonar World tape is the maneuver in order to see if the long bicipital tendon subluxes out of the bicipital groove. We continue the cyclic motion that Mike is doing, and we're going to move to the medial area. We're going to adjust the depth a bit so you begin to appreciate the coracohumeral distance and space. Here you see the bone acoustic landmark of the coracoid process, and as he cycles through, notice that now we expose the entire subscapularis. Also, as he internally rotates, Note again the distance between the bony coracoid process and the subscapularis. We're going to ask Mike to cycle closer to his abdomen as he internally rotates his arm. And that space that you see is going to be the coracohumeral space. So the second dynamic imaging that you're seeing in the anterior region of the shoulder is going to be where you could have a coracohumeral impingement. Often, if there's thickening of the subacromial subdeltoid bursa or tendinosis of the subscapularis, this could now impinge within this space. The other maneuver, aside from internal and external rotation of the coracohumeral space, is to ask Mike now to put the, his right hand on top of his left shoulder. This cross chest maneuver also exaggerates the coracohumeral distance. So here now you could see as he does that, therefore we begin to appreciate that it could impinge not only the subscapularis, but also the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. So this would be at least three types of maneuvers that you have to look at the anterior shoulder. The subluxing long bicipital tendon, the impingement of the coracohumeral area, and of course the collision of the lesser tuberosity onto the coracoid process. 
Now we're going to go to the superior quadrant of the shoulder. The second quadrant in the dynamic imaging of the shoulder is going to be the superior region and we're going to be taking a look at the acromiovicular joint. We are going to put the transducer on the vertex of the shoulder, which is the highest point of the shoulder. And here you see the bony acoustic landmark of the acromion, and then the clavicle, and right in the middle where you see the distance between the two subarticular plates is the joint space. The acromiovicular joint in a dynamic motion is going to be examined by asking the model to bring his right hand onto the top of his right, left shoulder. And as he goes through that cyclic motion, you'll notice that there is a translation in the coronal plane of the distal head of the clavicle towards the acromion. However, there is no collision nor impaction of the distal clavicle onto the acromion. The abnormality often found in this region is going to be the superior subluxation of the distal clavicle as the model continues to cycle superiorly in relation to the bony acoustic landmark of the acromion. And so what you want to see in this area is a sudden upward jump of the clavicle in relation to the acromion. Another area of dynamic imaging that will require exploration with an ultrasound is going to be the sternoclavicular joint. Patients may complain of a small bulging or even some pain and some swelling on that region. We're going to take a look at the acoustic landmarks of the sternoclavicular joint. Here you see the medial aspect of the clavicle and as you go a little bit more inferior now we begin to see the clavicle, the joint line, and then you see the top of the manubrium, which is the manubrial notch. So now we're going to just leave the transducer in this area. The maneuver that we're going to ask from our model is to bring both hands behind him and clasp his hands against his back. And then we're going to be asking him to lift his hands off his back and that should put stress on the sternoclavicular joint. So he's going to go back where he has his hands clasped behind him and it's going to be pressed against his back. This is the right sternoclavicular joint and you can always compare it to the left sternoclavicular joint. Here you can see part of the clavicle, the manubrial notch. We're going to explore the right side now where you see the sternoclavicular joint. We're going to ask our model now to go through the cycles wherein he's going to lift his hand off from his back and notice a minimal distraction of the joint and then back again. As he's going through the cycle, note how stable this joint is. What you will appreciate in this examination, if it's abnormal, would be the anterior subluxation of the medial head of the clavicle in relation to the manubrium of the sternum for a sternomanubrial type of subluxation dislocation. The third of four quadrants is going to be the dynamic imaging of the subacromial space where we may see entrapment of the supraspinatus impinging on the undersurface of the acromion. We're going to place the probe in a coronal plane in the long axis view of the supraspinatus along the entire plane of the patient's scapula. As we do that now, we're going to ask the patient to raise his arm and hand towards my elbow at a 45 degree, and you could see how smoothly the three units of the supraspinatus go in. The three units are the bony acoustic landmark of the greater tuberosity. The second unit is the fibrillar pattern of the supraspinatus tendon, which has a parrot beak contour. The third unit will be the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. In this maneuver, therefore, what is going to appear abnormal 
is if the entire three units cannot, with no friction at all, go underneath the subacromial space. Note the bony acoustic landmark of the acromion, which has no lateral type of subacromial spur. When you look at this type of maneuver, you'll appreciate that there is normal motion. An abnormal cogwheel, cogwheel translation, will tell you that there is subacromial impingement. In addition, it all depends on where the abnormality might be. Right now, our model mic is raising it at 45 degrees between the anterior and lateral planes of his body. If there was an abnormality in the anterior plane, then you may well move your transducer a little bit more anteriorly and then ask the model to raise his hand anteriorly in front of him and this is how you'll try to catch the abnormality. Another modification of this motion now, instead of extending his arm, we're going to ask him just merely to bend his elbow and raise his elbow towards my arm. And again, you are duplicating and reproducing the subacromial translation of the greater tuberosity supraspinatus and subacromial subdeltoid bursa. Still in the lateral or more like anterolateral area of the shoulder in the four quadrant display, on the lateral quadrant, we're going to take a look at the corcoacromial ligament, which is the roof for the rotator cuff, mainly for the supraspinatus. We're going to identify the bony acoustic landmark of the coracoid and that of the acromion. And once we have the compact fibrillar pattern of the ligament, we can now examine the coracoacromial ligament. We're going to direct the probe directly immediately below this ligament and now you can identify the rotator cuff. We're going to ask Mike our model to go ahead and internally and externally rotate his elbow and as you see the translation of the tendon you could f immediately appreciate the fact that it's gliding underneath the coracoacromial ligament. Any bumpy motion of this glide or any obstruction which may buckle or push the ligament upwards will confirm that there is underneath the coracoacromial ligament an impingement of the immediately subjacent rotator cuff. The fourth of the four quadrant exploration of the shoulder is going to be the posterior shoulder where we're going to look for the glenohumeral joint, look at the ball and socket maneuver of the area, and also we're going to try to show if there is going to be an internal impingement during those motions. We begin by putting the probe transversely across the model's back and adjust the depth since it's a deeper structure. Here you appreciate the convexity of the humerus with articular hyaline cartilage and then the bony acoustic landmark of the glenoid socket. On top of the glenoid socket, you can now appreciate the triangular fiber cartilage of the glenoid labrum. For confirmation that we're indeed in the glenohumeral joint, we're going to ask our model now to swing his hand and forearm outwards and then back in towards his abdomen. And now you can appreciate the ball and socket motion. This dynamic imaging as he externally rotates will exaggerate any glenohumeral effusion. So that's one of the first things you should take a look at, aside from the very smooth gliding and congruity of the glenohumeral joint. As he continues to do that, we're now going to look for changes that may imply or lead to the suspicion of an internal impingement. First, you look at if there's any contour deformation of the triangular contour of the gleno, of the posterior superior glenoid labrum. Here you see 
that the apex is mildly indenting, but that's about all that's happening in this professional model. The second thing you're going to look for is the normal variant bare area off the shoulder and see if it is deepened or widened. So as you continue to look now, there are several findings that may begin to lead to the suspicion of internal impingement. Note that the bare area is a bit deeper. Second, that it begins to impale on the apex of the labrum. And so those are two of the three findings. The triad that will tell you that the patient may have internal impingement is the first. A contour deformation of the glenoid labrum, a deepening of the bare area, and finally, undersurface fraying of the infraspinatus. So here we're going to see the fibrillar pattern of the infraspinatus, and now we're going to ask the patient to go ahead and externally rotate his shoulder to see how much impaling you see with the glenoid labrum. Note that the infraspinatus bunches up normally, and there is no hypochoic defects noted in the infraspinatus. The modification of the motion now is exactly what the model is doing, wherein we get to see that as he pretends to throw the ball, he straightens out his arm and we're back to normal. But as it does the a bare abduction external rotation, note again how the bare area of the shoulder is going to impale into the glenoid, but again at this point not scuffing the infraspinatus. We're going to ask the patient now to pause and do this in stages. First, we're going to start from neutral position. He's going to bring his arm down towards his side and rest his elbow and forearm in the neutral position. In stages, therefore, first we're going to ask him to raise his elbow outwards. Next, we're going to ask him to bring his hand back as if he was throwing a ball. Third, we're going to ask him as he was throwing the ball forward. So those are the three stages that you could look at the individual. The dynamic exploration of the elbow will entail again probably looking at it in four quadrant display but it's only in the anterior quadrant the ulnar quadrant or the medial quadrant and the posterior quadrant where we'll be looking for changes that may occur around the elbow many times if it's a bit more dedicated then the fourth quadrant which is going to be the radial quadrant is also going to be explored for radial collateral ligament tears so on the basic exploration of the elbow, what is most important now is to identify the medial collateral ligament. We're going to look for the anterior bundle of the medial collateral ligament. There's no space between the medial elbow and that of the table. So with a rolled up towel, we're going to bolster the elbow where now I have sufficient space in order to look for the anterior bundle of the ulnar collateral ligament. We are going to identify the bony acoustic landmark of the epitrochlea and connect it to the sublime tubercle in the coronary process. Here you see at the top of the image the apex of the epitrochlea down to the ulnar notch into the trochlear area of the humerus. Then you see the joint space and then the shark fin shape of the coronary process where you now have the nipple-like sublime tubercle. As you connect the two bony structures of the epitrochlea and that of the coronary process, now you see a packed fibrillar pattern representing the anterior bundle of the ulnar collateral ligament. Once you've identified that, then you could apply a valgus stress in order to stretch the ligament and open up 
the joint space if you need to. The other modification of this maneuver is in orthopedics. You put the patient in, again, some 30 degrees of flexion. Here, you, one more time, you can identify the anterior bundle of the ulnar collateral ligament. You're going to possibly show what's going on by grabbing the thumb of the patient and do the Laura Timmerman type of maneuver we're in now you could do a valgus stress and you stretch the ligament and also try to see if you can open up the ulnotrochial joint. Those are the two criteria. A disruption of the pack fibular pattern of the ulnar collateral ligament and a widening of the joint space of the ulnotrochial region. A continuum of the medial quadrant to dynamic imaging of the elbow is after you have evaluated the ulnar collateral ligament is to look for the cubital segment of the ulnar nerve. We're going to identify the bony acoustic landmark of the trochlea in short axis. Then we're going to look for the olecranon process. I'm going to move the patient a little bit more medially to give me a little bit more space because the table is hampering the cable end of my transducer. Here now you see in the cubital tunnel, right behind the apex of the epitrochlea, is a honeycomb structure representing the ulnar nerve within the cubital tunnel. In the short axis view, the dynamic imaging that we're going to proceed with is to do an inflection and extension of this region. So this is the motion that the patient is going to have and be doing while he is going to show you the cyclic motion on an active type of procedure. I'm now going to add a bit more gel. I'm going to let go of the transducer, let the model show you the flexion and extension. In addition, at the end of his flexion motion, I'm going to ask him to pump his elbow just in case we get to see a snapping triceps syndrome. I'm going to now plant my transducer on the epitrochlea. Here you see the olecranon at the bottom and that the ulnar nerve stays behind the apex of the trochlea. So this is the dynamic motion that you would require of your patient to see if that ulnar nerve, which is the hypochoic honeycomb pattern, subluxus anterior to the epitrochlea. In this case, for example, this is the normal position of an intact and normal ulnar collateral ligament within the cubital tunnel. The third of a four quadrant display examination of the elbow will be the exploration of the radial collateral ligament. We're going to put the patient in a pronation and identify the radiocollateral ligament by going to the posterolateral corner of the elbow. And once you have identified the common extensor tendon origin of the patient, identify the posterolateral corner of the radial head. We're going to put the elbow in 30 degree flexion. And here you could see mostly the common extensor tendon inserting onto the radial epicondyle. And you here, you could also appreciate at this level the difference in echogenicity of what is the radial collateral ligament and that of the fibrillar pattern of the tendon. A various stress against the corner of the table will show that you are stretching the radial collateral ligament. This is the maneuver that will accentuate any defects of the radial collateral ligament. The anterior coordinate dynamic imaging of the elbow will entail looking at the distal biceps tendon. A lot of people look at it in the long axis view. They identify the long, I'm sorry, the distal biceps tendon by taking a look at the radiocapitellar joint, move over to the radial neck and then the radial tubercle. Then they ask the patient to hypersupinate by turning his thumb down. Then the examiner moves the transducer to the medial aspect to identify the radial tubercle. 
with a little bit of heel toe maneuver now, you could see the nice fibrillar pattern of the distal biceps tendon inserting on the radial tubercle. In addition, you begin also to see the neck of the radius and the radial head itself. There's a little bit of partial volume averaging with the brachial artery. So this approach shows if there's any discontinuity, then you want to see the tendon evolves from the radial tubercle. This approach is great when you're looking for discontinuous distal biceps tendon. The other approach that's been published by the folks at Mayo Clinic is going to be looking at the distal biceps tendon in a coronal view. We begin by identifying the epitrochlea, the ulnar notch. Move the transducer distally, and as you do so on the deeper portions of the image, you begin to come onto the brachial artery, and deep to that now is the pack fibular pattern of the distal biceps tendon. We'll adjust the depth of the transducer, and so the hypochoic tubular structure is the brachial artery, and underneath that is going to be the fibular pattern of the distal biceps tendon. With a pronation, supination maneuver, now you get to see in the coronal plane the motion of the distal biceps tendon. Also, you see at the extreme right the radial tubercle. This type of dynamic imaging would work best for partial thickness tears in comparison to the direct approach of the long axis view of the distal biceps tendon. For the hand and fingers, it's the same four quadrant uh, display where in the extensor region is on the dorsum of the hand. Then you have the flexor region, which is another quadrant that you could look at. Then you have the radial area, for especially for the first compartment of the extensor region for Decker veins uh, disease. And last but not least, you can take a look at the fourth quadrant for the extensor carpal nares and the distal radio ulnar joint. The acronym is DRUDGE. We begin by looking at the area that is most commonly affected by taking a look at the carpal tunnel. We're going to identify the median nerve in the long axis view by looking at three bones. Your bone acoustic landmarks are going to be the radius, lunate, and capitate. We're going to ask micro model to put his hand flat on the table, and we're going to take a peek again at the bone acoustic landmark of the radius, lunate, and the peanut shape capitate. Once you've identified that, you'll see the intercalated fibrillar pattern of the flexor tendons, and then a fascicular pattern representing the median nerve. I'm going to move the focus to look at the median nerve mostly. I'm going to go a little bit more distal, maintaining again the three bones in tandem, radius, lunate, and capitate. I'm going to hold back the three fingers of our model and ask him to curl his index finger. And as he curls his index finger, you'll notice the translation of the tendons. While it's going through that cyclic motion, you'll notice that the fibrillar echo structures presumptive of tendons are the ones translating proximal to distal while the median nerve just bounces along with it but no translation. This would be again very important to see if there's anything trapping the motion not only of the tendons but if there's anything that is clinging on to the median nerve. Same thing can be seen in short axis view as we look at the median nerve, in order to identify it, let's take advantage of the anisotropy of tendons by taking a look at the tendons, make them hyperechoic. We're going to focus again on the median nerve, and you could see that the index tendon, the flexor tendons, are immediately below the honeycomb pattern of the nerve. So this is one dynamic motion that's very important. In addition, 
we could see that some of the lumbrical muscles might invade this carpal tunnel region where now it could be in a space occupying lesion. Here one more time you appreciate the translating flexor tendons both deep and superficial of the index finger and a relatively preserved median nerve. This would be the dynamic imaging most often wherein we initially evaluate the median nerve. But in actuality, as the cameraman zooms out, most of the natural type of work that occurs is going to be in supination, excuse me, in pronation rather than supination. We're now going to leave the transducer this way and we're going to ask the model now for Mike to go ahead and press all his fingertips together and look at the translation of the median nerve. I'm going to lift his hand up a little bit more, locate the median nerve again against the tendons, and press his fingers together and to see if there's any translation of that median nerve. Notice that it has a mild rotatory composition or translation, but does not get entrapped within the carpal tunnel region as we look at it again as he looks at his fingertips and as he closes them together you see the normal translation of the tendons but no abnormal subluxation or dislocation of the median nerve. So that would be the type of dynamic imaging that we could take advantage when we look at the carpal tunnel.